History of Sasquatch in British Columbia, Part 2. The 1950s marked the beginning of the modern era in Sasquatch history. New roads were rapidly pushed into wilderness areas, and vastly improved automobiles encouraged people to explore the great outdoors. Television became available to middle-income people, and along with other improved media, they became more aware of newsworthy events. By the late 1950s, the possible existence of Sasquatch became common knowledge. By the end of the century, substantial evidence had been collected, and the creature was now being studied more intently by professional people. Paul Hopkins reported finding large ape tracks in frost on a disused wharf on Roderick Island in December 1950. Hopkins had landed at an abandoned abalone cannery on the wharf to get a barrel. He walked by a building, and when, he and when he returned, there were ape tracks leading out of the building, presumably to the interior of the island, in half-inch frost. Two loggers exploring the woods in the Smithers area reported that they found large human-like tracks on a game trail around 1950. The distance between the steps was about five feet on level ground and four feet when going up a steep hill. They followed the tracks, and as they proceeded, they saw the alder trees on each side of the trail had their branches stripped bare up to 20 feet. The trees had four-inch diameter trunks at ground level. They were evidently bent over by something to access the leaves and buds at such a high level. One of the loggers tried to bend a tree, but he was unable to. Small twigs were found on the ground as though they had been spit out. Mackie and Slim Goodell reported an unusual occurrence in the McBride area during November 1951. The men were hunting and had left half a goat hanging in a tree while away overnight. When they returned to their campsite, they found 15 to 16-inch barefoot, human-like footprints in two inches of snow, estimated to be just a few minutes old. Whatever had made the tracks appeared to have slept in their lean-to. Also, the half-goat was gone. Residents from Clemtu reported that they saw unusual barefoot human-like tracks on Swindle Island in 1951. The tracks crossed a sandbar and entered Lake Kittisu. Most of the tracks were small, however, some were fairly large, with the largest being about 14 inches long. Swindle Island is considerably north of Vancouver Island. The area and lake in May would be too cold for human swimmers. A man reported that while driving, he saw an odd creature standing erect beside the main road near Terrace in 1952. The man slowed down and stopped his car. The creature watched him for a while, then turned and walked away. It stopped in the underbrush and turned around and looked at the man again. As it was dusk, its facial features could not be seen. The man said there were two other people who claimed to have seen the same thing in the same general area that year. Jack Twist reported that he saw a strange animal near Courtney along the Oyster River in September 1953. He was on a camping trip and stated that while walking back to camp on an old logging road, he saw a dark figure about 200 to 300 yards away. He thought it was one of his friends and called out, but did not get an answer. He continued walking straight towards the figure. When he got close enough to see what it was, he saw a huge creature covered in dark hair, it turned and faced him, then turned again, and walking upright, wandered into the forest. Twist heard it moving through the heavy brush. Judging from the overhanging trees where it had been, he estimated the creature's height as at least eight feet. A Vancouver couple reported unearthing a massive bone shaped like a human limb and foot on the Esquimalt First Nations Reservation in about 1953. One of the Eskimo tribal legends tells of its braves having killed a giant many years ago. William Rowe reported that he had a long and close-up look at what definitely appears to have been a Sasquatch near Tetshon Cache on Micah Mountain in October 1955. Rowe, a highway worker and experienced hunter and trapper, decided to hike up to a deserted mine on Micah Mountain for something to do. Just as he came within sight of the mine, he spotted what he thought was a grizzly bear, half hidden in the bush about 75 yards away. He had his rifle with him, but did not wish to shoot the animal, as he had no way of getting it out. He therefore calmly sat down on a rock behind a bush and observed the scene. A few moments later, the beast rose up and stepped into the open on two legs. 
He now saw that it definitely was not a bear, but what appeared to be a man-like creature about six feet tall, covered in dark brown, silver-tipped hair. The creature, unaware of Roe's presence, walked directly towards him. Roe then observed by its breasts that it was a female. It proceeded to the edge of the bush where Roe was hiding within twenty feet of his position. Here it crouched and began eating leaves from a bush. Roe was able to observe many important details as to how the creature walked, its physical makeup, and its habit of eating by drawing branches through its teeth. As to its appearance, Roe tells us, The head was higher on the back than at the front. The nose was broad and flat. The lips and chin protruded further than its nose. But the hair that covered it, leaving bare only the parts of its face around the mouth, nose, and ears, made it resemble an animal as much as a human. None of the hair, even on the back of the head, was longer than an inch, and that on its face much shorter. Its ears were shaped like a human's ears, but its eyes were small and black like a bear's, and its neck also was unhuman, thicker and shorter than any man's I've ever seen. In subsequent correspondence with Roe, he said that the creature's fingernails were not like a bear's, but short and heavy like a man's fingernails. Also, there were no bulging muscles, but the animal was as deep as it was wide. When the creature noticed Roe, a look of amazement crossed its face, which Roe found comical, and he chuckled to himself. Remaining crouched, the creature backed away three or four steps. It therefore straightened up, turned, and rapidly walked away in the direction whence it had come, glancing back twice at Roe over its shoulder. Realizing he had stumbled on something of great scientific interest, Roe leveled his rifle at the creature to kill it. However, he changed his mind because he felt it was human. In the distance, the creature threw its head back on two occasions and emitted a strange sound that Roe described as a half-laugh and half-language. Roe's examination of feces in the area, which he believed was from the creature, convinced him that it was strictly a vegetarian. What I have provided here is just a summary of Roe's report, which is highly detailed, also, I need to mention that he provided a sworn statement that the account he provided was true to the best of his powers of observation and recollection. Stan Hunt reported that while driving the Trans-Canada Highway to Vancouver on March 30, 1956, he saw a seven-foot upright creature covered in gray hair cross the highway near Flood. As he drove past the point of the crossing, he saw a second creature of similar appearance standing beside the road. He recounted the incident as follows. It was just near Flood, the other side of Hope. The light was just coming up. I almost ran into this gray horse on the road. That's the reason I remember the color. A little further on, I was going about 45 to 50 miles an hour when I saw these weird things. One crossed the road from the riverside. The other was already in the bushes. I could just see the top of its head. The creature was walking upright. I thought at first it was a great big bear, only it wasn't that big around. The hair was thinner and not matted like an animal. The whole thing was kind of eerie. There isn't much traffic that time of day, but I didn't stop. Hunt apparently later recalled getting a better look at the creature in the bushes, and he stated that it was gangly, not stocky like a bear. A man who said he was one of three people staying in a cabin near Seashelt reported a frightening experience that occurred in August 1956. One night, one of the men opened the door to go out, screamed, and came back into the room. After he calmed down, he said he had seen a huge creature standing in a doorway leading to a shed. A visitor from Erie, Pennsylvania, had a frightening experience while visiting Seashelt in August 1956. He was walking up a long driveway to his cabin when a huge, dark figure on a bank above hurled rocks at him. The visitor said that a friend had told him a Sasquatch had been seen in the area earlier in the month. The friend was apparently one of the men in the previous Seashelt incident. A hunter and two friends reported that they saw a Sasquatch inland from Bella Coola, 1956, during August. They watched the creature as it ate blueberries at the edge of a highway. They said it had a human-like face except for its protruding mouth. During 1957, a First Nations man presented a large leg bone to a newspaper reporter doing research in East Sook. The bone, which was shaped like a large human limb and foot, was claimed to have been from a Sasquatch and was offered as proof of the creature's existence. 
The relic had been uncovered by a man operating a bulldozer, excavating for a building foundation. The size of the bone indicated that it came from a creature that was at least 15 feet tall. The man who had the bone said he wanted to have it placed on display in the Empress Hotel in Victoria. Jimmy Fraser of the Songhees tribe recalled to a reporter in 1972 his encounter with a Sasquatch near East Sook at Matheson Lake in about 1957. While hunting in this area, he heard an ear-splitting roar and saw a gigantic hairy man, maybe 18 feet tall. Terror-stricken, Fraser ran as the creature tore trees out by their roots and hurled them at him. Rick Hedberg, age 9, and his younger brother Gary, age 7, were frightened by a strange creature they saw at Harrison Hot Springs in the summer of 1958. The boys' parents, which were local residents, were highly concerned with the story their boys told them. They liked to hike in the wooded hills around the hot springs at Harrison, and while up in this area, they said they encountered a hairy monster. It was standing upright by a large cedar tree about 75 feet away, facing half away from them with its face hidden by the tree. It was about seven feet tall and covered from head to foot with dark gray hair. It had an arm and an elbow, parts that they could see, like a human, not like a bear's leg. The boys remarked that it smelled worse than a bear. Upon spotting the creature, Rick managed to stay calm and slowly backed away, while Gary yelled, panicked, and ran back the way they had come. After Gary yelled, the creature ran on two legs straight down the steep slope beyond the tree toward Harrison Lake. Rick lost sight of it in about three seconds. Having no idea which way it might have turned or whether it was going to come after him, Rick decided to follow his younger brother out of the area. He did not see the creature again. When Gary came out of the woods just behind the hotel, he realized his brother was not with him. In a state of shock, he yelled for help, attracting the attention of several adults nearby. Rick, in the meantime, slowly walked out of the woods, looking over his shoulder now and then to make sure the monster was not following him. He emerged from the woods to see the adults trying to calm his brother and attempting to get the facts about a hairy monster that might be eating Rick. When Gary saw Rick, he shouted with joy at seeing him alive. At this point, the adults, save one kindly lady, lost interest and dismissed the whole incident as young boys trying to get attention. The lady told the boys to go home and tell their parents what had happened. The boys told their parents, who listened and then dismissed the whole matter, telling them to never speak of the incident again and stay out of the woods behind the hotel. Rick took his parents' advice and stayed silent for 37 years. Then, as an adult living in Calgary, Alberta, Rick took an interest in Sasquatch research and became friends with researcher Thomas Steenberg in about 1993. It was at least two years, however, before Rick decided to tell Steenberg of his and his brother's Sasquatch encounter at Harrison. In relating the story to Steenberg, Rick reasoned that the creature was seemingly hiding behind the larger cedar tree. It was not hiding from them, but from the human voices that came from the Hotel Hot Springs structure, just out of sight from its position. The creature had its right arm around the tree as if it were holding itself steady. Rick is sure it had a large hand at the end of its arm, not a paw. He said that at first he thought it was a large grizzly bear. Rose Hibben and a friend reported that they saw a hair-covered erect creature in the New Hazleton area during August 1958. The creature was seen on the road in daylight. Also, a man reported seeing a huge, erect, hair-covered creature cross the road in front of his car about 13 miles south of New Hazleton, also in August 1958. Hunters George Robson and Bert Soljell reported a big ape sighting in the Bella Coola area at Burnt Bridge on December 8, 1958. The men were seated by their fire when they noticed a huge, dark, erect creature with long arms like a big ape standing in waist-high brush watching them about 50 yards away. As soon as they returned its gaze, the creature ran off quickly, disappearing over a rise. The men immediately went over to watch it run down the hill, but it had already disappeared. They found only one heel print in a patch of snow and concluded that the creature had been deliberately dodging the snow patches. To do so, they felt it would have to leap much farther than a human could and also... A human could not have moved fast enough to get out of sight so quickly. They reasoned that their fire might have attracted the creature. 
Two other hunters, seated at the other side of the fire, did not see the creature. Later, loud screams were heard. Lawrence Hopkins stated that he saw an ape while waiting on the shore of Aristizable Island to be picked up by friends during March 1959. He had just shot a deer and evidently dragged it to the shoreline. Hopkins says he sensed a strong animal odor, and when he turned around, saw the creature emerging from the underbrush directly behind him. Fearful that the animal might attack, Hopkins ran to the water and swam to a small islet just offshore. When he felt the creature had left, he found a drift log and paddled back to the island to await his friends. H. Dudick reported that he saw something highly unusual in the clinton Lillooet area during the fall of 1959. Dudick was hunting when he saw some massive legs covered with yellowish-brown hair protruding from behind a stump. He froze in his tracks for a few moments, then retreated without seeing the torso or head of whatever was behind the stump. After a couple of hours, he returned to the spot and followed huge foot tracks in the snow to a ravine. Mrs. Bellevue reported seeing a Sasquatch while camped with her husband near Enderby at Hidden Lake on Labor Day weekend, 1959. The couple had been there for five days. Mrs. Bellevue left their tent area to collect some campfire kindling at about 7.30 p.m. She suddenly became intensely aware that she was being watched. She looked up and off to a small knoll with a pine tree about 50 feet away. Beside the tree and partially concealed by lower branches, stood a tall, heavy, human-like figure. It appeared to be well over six feet tall and was covered with rust-colored hair, which lightened around the chest area. Its forehead sloped back and parts of his face were without hair. The nose was just a flat area with two holes. The mouth appeared to be little more than a slit. The creature just stood there motionless, studying Mrs. Bellevue. She slowly backed away and returned to their campsite. She did not immediately tell her husband what she had seen, when all of a sudden I knew we had to get out of there, and that's when I told him about it. Her husband didn't show the surprise she expected. He said, I had been fixing my fishing tackle when suddenly something told me it was okay to spend the night there, but we'd better leave tomorrow. His wife's story confirmed his feeling. The next day, the couple packed up their camping equipment and as they dismantled the last tent poles, they heard the sound of running feet moving gradually away from them through the bush. The sounds faded and disappeared. The Bellevues then left the area. Roy Miller reported he had a possible Sasquatch encounter in the Rocky Mountains in the 1950s. He was following a sheep trail on a high plateau, and when he stooped over to avoid branches, he encountered a Sasquatch-like creature coming the other way. It immediately leaped off into the brush. Miller said it was as tall as he was and had reddish-brown hair on its face. He added that it did not have enough hair on its body and its arms were too long to be a bear. He said its movements were like those of a monkey. Arthur Boundsound Sr., an experienced fisherman and trapper, was frightened away from his anchorage in a remote mainland bay during the 1950s. The man reported that he had anchored his boat to brew a pot of tea. A Sasquatch appeared on the shore and threw a small log toward the man's boat. The man immediately pulled anchor and moved to another spot. Edwin James, along with a group of friends and family members, reported that they surprised a Sasquatch digging for clams on Guilford Island in the 1950s. A cook named Sophie, working at a logging camp between Peachland and Princeton, reported that she saw a Sasquatch in the early 50s. Sophie said all the men were out falling trees at the time. Joe Hopkins of Klemtu reported that he saw an upright ape-like creature on the beach of Price Island at Higgins Pass in February 1960. Hopkins was digging clams at the time and saw the creature walk up the beach and into the trees. He stated it was about the size of a small man. It had apparently been down by the water, and as Hopkins came around a point, he noticed it walking away. Fishermen Timothy Robinson and Samson Duncan stated that they saw and shot at a small ape-like creature on the beach of Roderick Island at Watson Bay in the winter of 1960. The men were on their fishing boat at the time, and after the creature ran away, they went ashore and found blood on the snow. They stated that they were afraid to follow it. Mrs. D. Mott wrote that her younger son was frightened by something strange at their farm in Langley in February 1960. 
Her boy went out at about 7 a.m. to clear the barn before milking. He came back in the house, very agitated, saying that he had seen a strange creature outside through a wide opening in the boards of a shed. He said the creature was about four and a half feet high, covered with shaggy hair, and walking like a human, but slightly crouched. Mrs. Mott, and probably her husband, investigated, but nothing was found. They said they did not look for tracks because children had trampled the snow down while playing the evening before. Woodsman, hunter, and fisherman John Bringsley reported that he came face to face with a great beast while picking huckleberries near Nelson at Lemon Creek in early August 1960. The encounter took place at the head of the creek on a deserted logging road. His frightening experience is presented here in his own words. I had just stopped my 1931 coupe on a deserted logging road and walked about a hundred yards into the bush. I was picking huckleberries. I had just started to pick berries and was moving slowly through the bush. I had only been there about 15 minutes. For no particular reason, I glanced up, and that's when I saw this great beast. It was standing about 50 feet away on a slight rise in the ground, staring at me. The sight of this animal paralyzed me. It was seven to nine feet tall, with long legs and short, powerful arms with hair covering its body. The first thing I thought was, what a strange-looking bear. It had very wide shoulders and a flat face with ears flat against the side of its head. It looked more like a big hairy ape. It just stood there staring at me. Arms of the animal were slightly bent, and most astounding was that it had hands, not claws. It was about 8 a.m., and I could see it very clearly. The strangest thing about it was the bluish-gray tinge of color of its long hair. It had no neck. Its ape-like head appeared to be fastened directly to its wide shoulders. When the creature started to move towards him, he fled to his car and quickly left the area. He returned the next day with friends and upon inspection found a 16 to 17 inch footprint. A woman reported an unusual experience she had near Chilliwack at Cultus Lake Provincial Campground in August 1960. She and four family members had arrived late and decided not to pitch their tents but to sleep out in the open. The site they chose was a flat gravel area far from the other campsites. Sometime after midnight, the woman was awakened by the sound of small stones falling around her and her sleeping family. The woman alone was awakened and lay in fear for about two hours as the stones continued to fall. In the morning, 40 to 50 small stones were counted laying on the gravel surface near and between the sleeping bags. The stones, although larger than the small, even-sized pea gravel, were less than one and a half inches in diameter. The woman did not detect any odor and heard nothing other than the stones landing. Upon inspecting the area, an obvious trail was seen, which indicated a large animal had walked through a nearby stand of tall stinging nettle. Mrs. Gary Sterry reported that she found a large human-like footprint about six miles from the Harrison Hot Springs Hotel on April 19, 1961. She found it while walking her little girl to the school bus. The print was on the gravel road leading to her home. It measured about 12 inches long and 10 inches wide at the toes. Mrs. Story stated that she had heard unusual noises outside her home on the previous night. She also said that a broken teacup was taken from her garbage can overnight and carried some distance down the road. There was only one clear footprint impression. However, other indentations that might have been footprints were observed. Bill Winnig reported seeing a strange creature near Cumberland in September 1961. Winnig and another youth had camped for several days on a sandbar at the head of Forbush Lake in the Puntledge Valley. As they were leaving, Winnig looked back and saw an animal walk out of the bush on two legs onto the sandbar. It squatted, stood again, and then walked into the forest. It was dark-colored and had no neck. Winnig remembered that it seemed to be checking the sandbar at the spot where the two had camped. John Bringsley, who reported seeing a Sasquatch near Nelson in 1960, had another sighting here in October 1961. He had gone to the area with another man hoping to see another Sasquatch. At midnight, they saw the upper body of one of the creatures silhouetted in the moonlight. It was in the trees, just short of where the trail went out onto open rock. Bringsley estimated the creature was seven to eight feet tall. Bob Titmus, who was researching Sasquatch with funding from oil millionaire Tom Slick, 
reported finding a long string of large footprints on a small island offshore from Swindle Island in October 1961. He saw the tracks with binoculars from his boat. As there was no way to get ashore other than to swim, Titmus stripped off his clothing and did just that. The tracks were about 13 to 13 and a half inches long and approximately 6 inches wide at the ball of the foot. The stride was about 4 feet. Some of the impressions were quite deep, although he could see that the creature was only walking. The tracks came out of the water and angled toward the timber and undergrowth. They paralleled the growth line for about 125 feet and then entered it. He stated that the tracks appeared very similar to 14-inch tracks that had been found in California. He was unable to spend a great deal of time on the island due to the cold weather and for fear of his boat breaking anchor. A couple sitting down to breakfast at their residence about four miles south of Morristown reported that they watched in amazement as a Sasquatch strolled by during 1961. The creature, which they described as about eight feet tall, black, hair-covered, very heavy and with a flat face, walked erect across a field and then across the highway. After it left sight, they inspected the path and found 300 yards of five-toed, flat, 16-inch long footprints that sank four to five inches deep in the field. The depth of the prints, compared to their own, was awe-inspiring. Harry Squinnis reported that while camped with his family near Bella Coola at Anaheim Lake, Goose Point area, in 1962, he observed four Sasquatch. Squinnish said that the couple's baby was crying and he saw a head and forearm come in through the tent flap. The creature had a monkey face, but its head was bigger than a human's. Also, the arm was covered with long, dark brown hair. Squinnish grabbed for his flashlight and gun, but the flashlight was not working. At the same time, the creature wandered off. After leaving his tent to investigate, Squinnish threw gasoline on the campfire and in the bright flare, he saw four of the creatures. They raised up after laying face down on the ground at the edge of his camp area, about 14 feet from his tent. They all walked slowly away, walking like men. All were about eight feet tall. Squinnis called to them, Hey, what are you doing out there? Hey, come back. However, the creatures just kept walking. He thought that the reason one of the creatures peeked into his tent was because the baby was crying. The next day, Squinnis found big finger marks in the dust on a poplar tree with its bark skinned about eight feet up. This is an interesting account from the standpoint that a crying baby was involved. There are a number of incidents in which Sasquatch are apparently attracted to children. The creatures simply stand and watch the children at play. In Russia, there is an account of a mother who left a baby to fetch water. The baby apparently started to cry and when the mother returned, she found a female almosty cuddling her baby. Perhaps something like this could happen with a Sasquatch. A young woman reported that she spotted a Sasquatch mother holding a child by the hand on the banks of the Bella Coola River in April 1962. The woman was out walking with her own two children when she saw the creatures. Word was also circulating in the little town at about the same time that other people had seen the mum at night. Sasquatch sightings of a lone creature are by far the norm. However, it stands to reason that those solitary big guys were once toddlers, and this is a little proof. A commercial fisherman reported that he saw ten apes near Kitimat on June 8, 1962. He was cleaning fish with his boat tied to the shore. Several creatures, like apes, came out on an overhanging tree. He guessed about ten of them. Thoroughly shocked, the fisherman started his boat motor and fled, breaking his shorelines. He at first said they were apes, but later changed his story to bears. However, bears don't usually come in such large numbers, and we have to wonder if bears would have greatly shocked the man. Alec Lindstrom and friend George Bryant reported a long-distance sighting of a strange creature in the Wells area near Stony Lake on July 23, 1962. The men were in a boat on a lake when they saw an erect, light gray animal standing on the shore more than half a mile away. They said it looked to be between 9 and 10 feet tall and very heavy. They went towards it and it eventually turned and ran into the trees. They observed the creature for about 6 to 10 minutes. Bob Titmus reported that during the summer of 1962, he found 1,200 yards of bipedal tracks much larger than human tracks, in deep moss on Aristizable Island. He also reported that during August of 1962, 
he found flat 14-inch tracks with a 42-inch pace in a creek bed on an island in Devastation Channel. A woman stated that she saw a tall, hair-covered man near Hickson in August 1962. She said he was about seven feet tall and covered in black hair. The oddity came towards her as she was walking along a local creek. When he noticed her, he jumped into the bushes. Thanks for listening. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button.